Diagnosing and treating women with IDA. What every clinician needs to know. Have you heard that iron deficiency, even without anemia, is associated with impaired physical performance and cognitive ability? Did you know that iron deficiency with anemia during pregnancy can increase the risk for various maternal complications, as well as neurocognitive deficits in fetal development? The global presence of anemia in women is almost 30%. Iron deficiency, or ID, accounts for at least half of these cases, with heavy menstrual bleeding, or HMB, being the most common cause. Yet both HMB and ID are under-recognized by clinicians and underappreciated as factors contributing to poor health outcomes in women. In this educational activity, we will consider the causes, clinical features, and impact of undertreated ID and iron deficiency anemia, or IDA and chart a course toward better outcomes for adolescent girls and women. Let's first review iron physiology and the pathogenesis of ID and IDA. Iron is normally absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract following dietary ingestion, then transported via serum transferrin, preferentially to the bone marrow, where about two-thirds is incorporated into heme. Excess iron is transported principally to the liver, where it binds to ferritin for storage. In healthy individuals, Iron homeostasis is regulated mainly by the hepatic protein hepcidin. Hepcidin protects the body from iron overload. Following ingestion of iron, hepcidin levels rise, inhibiting further absorption of iron from the gut and the release of iron stored in the liver and elsewhere. After about 48 hours, hepcidin levels reduce once again to allow for absorption of iron from the gut and its release from the stores. In the event of iron deficiency, hypoxia, or blood loss, Hepcidin is downregulated, resulting in increased absorption of dietary iron and release of stored iron. Iron is essential for many physiologic processes beyond its role in heme, such as muscle function, cellular respiration, and others. Because the body prioritizes heme, ID adversely affects the function of several organ systems before we see changes in blood parameters, such as hemoglobin, hematocrit, or red cell indices. As a result, Symptoms of ID, such as fatigue, reduced exercise tolerance, or impaired cognitive function, are often experienced before the onset of IDA. Conceptually, IDA should be considered the end point of ID, one that doesn't manifest until iron levels are so low that heme production is impaired. Now let's look at the causes of ID in women. Heavy menstrual bleeding, or HMB, the most common cause of ID in reproductive-aged women, is defined as excessive menstrual blood loss that interferes with a woman's physical, social, emotional, and material quality of life. It may affect more than half of reproductive-aged women, with almost one-third experiencing fatigue, shortness of breath, and impaired physical activity affecting their daily life, symptoms that may relate to ID. HMB also increases healthcare resource utilization and leads to lost productivity. Unfortunately, HMB is normalized by most cultures, and even for those who recognize a problem, many are unaware or have limited access to even simple medical and minimally invasive treatment options. As a result, evidence suggests that only about half of the women experiencing HMB consult a physician regarding their symptoms. Among those, less than half are offered therapy. How about ID in pregnancy? Nearly half of women start pregnancy with low or absent iron stores. But did you know that periconceptual ID may impair fetal neurodevelopment with subsequent childhood mental health abnormalities that can extend to the adult years? This situation is further complicated by the physiological elevation of hepcidin levels in the first trimester, which reduces iron absorption and release. Since iron is prioritized for heme production, in ID, other growth is impaired, and normal neurodevelopment is particularly at risk. Hepcidin levels decrease after 12 gestational weeks, facilitating the dramatically increased iron requirements later in the pregnancy. Particularly in the third trimester, iron requirements increase tenfold to support the expansion in maternal red cell mass, maintain placental and fetal growth, and support recovery from excessive blood loss during or after delivery. Iron-deficient women are unprepared to meet this critical need. You should evaluate all reproductive-aged women for ID and offer treatment even when they are not anemic given the impact of ID on clinical outcomes and quality of life. At the same time, you should simultaneously address the causes of ID, 
such as dietary deficiency, poor absorption, and especially HMB. Although we don't go into detail in this activity, the causes and treatment of HMB can be determined following the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics Systems. Now let's look at the diagnosis of ID and IDA. Patients may first experience headache, fatigue, pica, weakness, exertional dyspnea, hair loss, brittle nails, cold insensitivity, and restless leg syndrome. Symptom severity typically depends on the degree of iron depletion. Unfortunately, the recommendations for screening for ID and anemia in general are inconsistent among the various societies and government organizations for both non-pregnant and pregnant individuals. In otherwise healthy women, ID can be diagnosed with a serum ferritin level less than 25 micrograms per liter. When ferritin levels are increased by chronic inflammation, transferrin saturation, or TSAD of less than 20%, is a more sensitive indicator. Women with IDA typically have serum ferritin levels lower than 10 micrograms per liter, and their TSAD is often less than 16%. In women, anemia is diagnosed with hemoglobin less than 12 grams per deciliter. IDA usually manifests with red cell indices demonstrating hypochromic microcytic cells with a low mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. What about treatment? In most instances, oral iron should be the first-line option for ID, with or without anemia. Oral iron is generally safe, inexpensive, and readily available. However, up to 40% of patients taking oral iron experience gastrointestinal side effects, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and an unpleasant metallic taste. Fortunately, alternate day oral iron can not only prevent or reduce these symptoms, but also increase the absorption of iron because of the reduced levels of hepcidin. So how do we monitor response to oral iron therapy? There is usually an increase in hemoglobin levels of at least 1 gram per deciliter by 2 to 4 weeks. If not, the patient should be reassessed for compliance, side effects, and possible contributors to diminished absorption. Those who respond appropriately may continue oral iron until reaching the target hemoglobin level of 12 grams per deciliter or higher, and iron stores are replete based on a ferritin level of at least 25 micrograms per liter, or a TSAT of more than 20%. How about intravenous or IV iron? IV iron is generally indicated for patients with IDA who have an intolerance or an unsatisfactory response to oral iron and who are otherwise inappropriate for oral iron. IV iron may also be considered when rapid repletion is needed, for instance, in preoperative settings, because the response is usually faster than oral iron, or postoperatively for the treatment of ID or IDA when hepcidin levels are high and oral iron is even less effective. Pregnant women with confirmed IDA can receive IV iron during their second trimester or later, especially when rapid correction is required, such as severe anemia at an advanced gestational age. In postpartum women with anemia and hemoglobin levels of 10 grams per deciliter or less, treatment with IV ferric carboxymaltose, or FCM, was more effective than oral iron in correcting anemia and replenishing iron stores. FCM was also better tolerated than oral iron. The recommended dose of IV iron required to treat IDA and replete iron stores varies, but is typically about 1,500 mg. IV iron preparations vary in the dose that can be administered in a single infusion, thereby impacting the number of infusions required to treat the patient adequately. This circumstance may be an important factor when selecting a formulation. Regardless, all of these formulations have been proven to be safe when administered during pregnancy. Common side effects of IV iron formulations are generally transient and clinically insignificant. They include nausea, headaches, hypertension, flushing, and injection site reactions, all of which can be managed by symptomatic care or by reducing the infusion rate. While the risk of IV administration does carry a very small risk of anaphylaxis, the administration should occur in an environment where healthcare providers are trained to recognize and manage such events. Treatment with IV iron must be avoided in women with a history of anaphylaxis or serious reactions to parenteral iron therapy and those with active bacterial infections and severe liver disease. The frequency of follow-up visits depends on the patient and whether rapid treatment was initiated due to impending surgery or severe IDA. Patients who do not respond to IV iron therapy should be referred to hematology, internal medicine, or nephrology for further evaluation and management. Once the desired response is achieved, 
Regular follow-up visits and monitoring of IDA markers should be considered in the context of the patient's clinical situation. Iron deficiency, with or without anemia, is prevalent in women and can affect their health, quality of life, physical and mental well-being, and even children. ID and IDA remain vastly underdiagnosed and frequently poorly managed. HMB is often normalized, and its role in the development of ID is underrecognized, affecting women throughout their lifespan. Therefore, it is incumbent on all clinicians caring for women to become more aware of the implications of IDA in a fashion that allows more women the opportunity for timely diagnosis and access to safe and effective treatment.